When Jesus Christ came to this earth 2,000 years ago, he established his church. He told the Apostle Peter, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Why then are there so many churches today that call themselves Christian, followers of Christ? Is Christ's true church divided into thousands of different sects and denominations? What, after all, is the purpose of the church? Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the program. Few people understand the purpose, the reason for Jesus Christ's ministry on this earth 2,000 years ago. He certainly did not come on a soul-saving crusade. The first uh, chapters of Acts talk about 120 disciples being there present for the first Pentecost service. 120 after three and a half years of Christ's ministry. That's it. He was not on a soul-saving crusade. In fact, as it says in your Bible, it says this in the Gospels, he came to build the church. To build the church. We'll look at that here in a moment in Matthew 16. This is from uh, Herbert Armstrong's book, Mystery of the Ages. We just uh, advertised this on the program last week. But it says here, the real truth about the church, the reason for its origin and its purpose, has remained hidden from even the professing Christian world. So even the Christian world today doesn't really understand the the purpose and the meaning of the church. So many people in the world of uh, traditional Christianity, they just view the church as a, a building on a street corner. In fact, if you look at the meaning of the word church, the Greek word ekklesia, it means called out ones. Called out of this world and into God's true church. This is Matthew 16, and we'll start in verse 13. It says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea uh, Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that you are John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said unto them, But whom say you that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And so God revealed it to these few disciples. This was Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. But what did he come to this earth? to do. What did he do during that earthly ministry 2,000 years ago? Verse 18 continues, he said, And I say also unto you that you are Peter, and upon this rock, that's speaking of himself, Jesus Christ, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So Jesus came to this earth to build something, to build a church. In fact, to start or to build a new world, a new world that would then be born uh, at the return of Jesus Christ, born as the kingdom of God, the family of God. And it all started in the smallest of ways, that word church, as I say. It comes from the Greek word ekklesia, and it means called out ones. Now, let's look at uh, John chapter 6 called out ones, and we'll see here what uh, Jesus had to say about those who were called out uh, of this world. Let me just take you to another quote from Mr. Armstrong. He said, I sometimes wonder how many of you really comprehend what I've said so many times. God is not calling everybody to salvation, yet have not all without realizing it simply accepted the one most generally believed false teaching that God is now desperately trying to get everybody saved. So many people, even in the world of Christianity, that's what they believe, that Christ came on a soul-saving crusade, that He's desperately trying to get people saved. And, of course, as we've pointed out before, if that's the case, well, He's surely losing in that battle because look at how many people have just flat-out rejected religion, period, the Bible, 
Christianity. He was not on a soul-saving crusade. In fact, he spent the better part of his ministry, Jesus Christ, with that handful of disciples. Now, his miracles, they did attract a, a lot of people. There were crowds that followed him everywhere that he went. But he'd talk to the crowds in parables, and then he'd go away with his 12 disciples, and he'd explain the meaning. He'd teach them the meaning of those parables. You can read about that in Matthew 13. But let's look at John 6, verse 44. It says, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So Christ tells these individuals, these disciples, No man can come to me unless the Father draws him, unless the Father performs a miracle and, and opens that mind to be able to understand. You can't just show up at the door of the, the local church and invite yourself in. Not if it's God's church. Now that's the way it is in the world. It's come as you may. Everybody come in. The doors are wide open. But if you read what John 6 and verse 44 says, it can't happen. You can't come to Christ unless God the Father does something. And of course, He has done something in the lives of a few a little flock, as they're often called in the New Testament. Jesus told the disciples to go to the lost sheep, a scattered group, to reach them with the message. Now, God's church does proclaim a message out for everyone to hear, if they so choose. That's why we have these programs on TV and such. But for you to come to the truth and into the church of God, it does take God's hand. It does take God's call, as it says there in John 6 and verse 44. Verse 45 says, It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that has heard and has learned of the Father comes unto me. So everyone will have a chance eventually to be taught God's truth. If you extend this purpose, this plan on out, on out to the return of Christ, the establishment of God's kingdom on this earth, the wonderful world of tomorrow, when, when the knowledge of God will cover this earth and everyone, young and old alike, will be taught these precious truths that we get into on this very program. But now step back and look at the world today. Look at what you see when you turn on the news or, or you read the newspaper. The reason the world is the way it is is because of what happened at the foundation of this world. And Herbert Armstrong explains that in his book, Mystery of the Ages. I gave you a quote from that book earlier. But he says early on in that book that uh, he was compelled to write it when God gave him a deeper understanding of what happened at the end of Genesis 3, where after Adam and Eve rejected, they made the decision to reject the tree of life, and they took from the forbidden tree the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when that happened, God, it says at the end of Genesis 3, He sent them forth from the garden, and He barred re-entrance. They couldn't come and take from the tree of life after that. The tree of life represented God's spirit. It represented God's character, His nature, His life. And man, since the Garden of Eden, has been cut off from that spirit, from that life of God. And so we've been just going our own way these past many thousands of years, except for the few that God has seen fit to call out of this world to further His purpose. And you can see it in Genesis 12. He, he uh, called Abraham, told him to leave his country and to go to a, a strange land, a foreign land. And then Isaac, his son, and then Jacob. God was going to raise up a nation and, and, and actually a multitude of nations too through Abraham and his family. And then you look through the, the thread of the Bible and you see all these instances where God uh, selected Moses, for example, to lead the Israelites out of captivity. And then Joshua to succeed Moses and to take the Israelites into the promised land. And on and on and on it goes. Just the few, though, overwhelmingly, the majority, whether you look at the Old Testament history or whether you look at the church age from the first century through to, uh, 
through to today, the, the church century, I mean, the, the first century with Jesus Christ and the disciples, on through to today, you see, again, a little flock, just a few people that have been called out of this world. Let's just look over at Matthew 28 uh, and verse 18. The world represents God's plan of salvation as this, uh, this giant contest going on between God and, and the devil, this tug of war where they're trying to struggle over how many souls they're going to win. And that's not what your Bible teaches. It's just not. Your Bible talks about this being the age of the first fruits, those that are, that are called out in advance so that God can prepare them to marry His Son, Jesus Christ, and then to work through them to teach the whole world, to teach all of mankind from every religion, from every walk of life, from every nation, so that everyone has an opportunity. God is fair. He wants to bring this truth to all of mankind, not just a, a few during one <laughs> tiny little portion of time. It's going to expand on out. Notice, though, in this church age, it says here in Matthew 28, verse 19, he says to his disciples, Go you, therefore, and teach all nations. If you look at the Revised Standard Version, it means to make disciples of all nations. So go ahead and proclaim this message. Matthew 24, 14 says to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God as a witness. Put it out there as a witness. So, so no one can say, well, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you uh, come to me with the message? Once everything comes crashing down in this world, God's going to leave us all without excuse. He says, take the message out as a warning, and as you do that, there will be a few that come out of this world because of John 6, 44. And when they do, make disciples of them. They're students. They're coming into the church, and the church is like a teacher's college. They're coming into the, into the church to learn the truth of God so that they can then teach it to others. Verse uh, 20 it says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Teach them, teach the called out ones, so that they can, they can then go and teach others. You can see this principle uh, as it's discussed in 2 Timothy 2, where Paul told Timothy, now you go out and look for disciples that you can teach and train and prepare so that they'll be ready to teach when the kingdom of God is set up and established. Now, there's another reason why God uh, calls us out of this world in this age, besides just preparing us for teaching in the world of tomorrow. We also come out in advance so that we can support this end-time work, so that we can get behind that gospel warning message going out to this world so that these operations, like you see on this program, can expand and grow and reach more people with the truth of God, with God's loving warning. There's a lot more that we could get into here. I'll just refer you to the history of God's true church. This is the true history. Fascinating book. A book that will take you into this subject in some kind of depth. It's uh, more than 200 pages. And uh, if you haven't gotten this for your library yet, uh, call our operators today and make sure you request the true history of God's true church and then also the little book. This is about um, an end time book that God sent as a warning to his wayward people. Uh, this tells you the significance of that, of that work, of that book. And uh, if you want this and then the book it refers to, we can certainly uh, make that available to you as well. We'll be right back. But why? Why the Feast of First Fruits? Why is this church the first fruits of God's harvest for His kingdom? Is God unfair? Is He discriminating against others to choose us first and they have to wait and come later? Brethren, I want to say to you, I think that most of you don't understand that at all. I think that most of you think that it merely means that God chose us to get into the kingdom first and then they'll come in later. That is not the answer at all. 
And I perceive that even our ministers, when they preach, take it for granted that we're just a, the whole goal is to get us into the kingdom of God, and that's all we're called for now, and for no other purpose, but we'll get in ahead of the others. Then God is discriminating against the others. There is a reason why we're the first fruits. And I wish I could drive that home. But I fear that most of you just don't get it. You don't understand it at all. Why? Why are we the first fruits? I'm going to try to make it plain this afternoon, and still I think you won't get it. So much Protestantism has rubbed off on us, we can't get it out of our heads. They think God is trying to save the whole world, and then we think, well, he's just saving us first. And that is not the answer at all. That's Herbert Armstrong back in uh, 1985 addressing God's true church, saying there's a reason. There is a reason. There's a time order to God's plan and purpose here. And the reason we're brought into the church now, as opposed to later, is because God is training us. He's teaching us. He's preparing us so that we can be able to train and teach and prepare others. It's all about extending this family plan in much the same way a father and mother would raise up a child in the way that he should go, as it says in the Proverbs. That's what we're endeavoring to do spiritually. And then added to that, as I said before the break, we're here too to support the work, to help the work, to get behind the work, to fervently pray for the work, to support it in every way that we can. Look at what uh, Paul said about the body of Christ, or the church, here in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. It says, For the body is one, and has many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Now, this is a, a church area in the first century where uh, there were a lot of people splitting off into their own factions. There, there was division in the church. And Paul said, you can read 1 Corinthians, uh, the first chapter and chapter 3 as well, where Paul says, look, there's no division here. Christ isn't divided. There's just the one head. There's just the one body. There's just the one church. There's a lot of God's people today, even, in the Laodicean era, this seventh and final era that's characterized by being lukewarm and blind and naked, spiritually speaking. And they've lost sight of the fact that there's just the one church carrying out God's will. And of course, it's incumbent upon you to prove where that is so that you can get behind it and support it. But suffice it to say, Christ isn't working through a hundred denominations. He's not working through three or four. He's the head. And we just want to be where the head is. Where is the head? Where is Jesus Christ? Notice verse 13, it says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether bond or free. We have been all made to drink into the one Spirit. And then verse 14 continues, For the body is not one member, but many. So there are, there are many members in the one body, just like you have many members in a physical, a human body. But there's only the one head, and that's what we have to know. We have to believe. We have to follow that one head that is Jesus Christ. Verse 18, it says, For now has God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased Him. So even, even the, the lower-ranking members, the lay members, God has an awesome purpose and plan for them. And He brings them into the body so that they can support the work of the church and prepare to teach the world. Ephesians chapter 4, the companion chapter to 1 Corinthians 12, here it talks about the body of Christ as well. I'll read verse uh, 16. This is in the Revised Standard Version. It says, For whom the whole body joined and knit together by every joint with which it is supplied, when each part is working properly, makes bodily growth and upbuilds itself in love. Just like you don't have members of your physical body breaking away and doing their own thing. 
Everything functions together. That's the analogy that Paul chose. And it's because there's just the one church carrying out God's will, fulfilling God's will, proclaiming God's truth as a warning witness, supporting God's work, and preparing, even as they do that, preparing for their positions in God's family to raise and to teach children. Verse 15, backing up it says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. See, Christ is the head. There's just the one head on this body. And when you think about the Worldwide Church of God under the, the leadership, the loving leadership of Herbert Armstrong over 50 years, no wonder there was such wonderful growth and development in that church. No wonder so many, there were so many exciting projects that were carried out around the world. It's because of that family government. It's because of that singular purpose. There weren't all kinds of divisions in that church, not until after he died. After he dies, then everything just split apart, and everyone went their separate ways. And people to this day think that, well, that's okay. We can all just kind of do our own thing. What does your Bible say? Christ is not divided. There's the one body with the one head. Again, think of John 6 and verse 44. God calling us out of this world and into His body, His spiritual body. This is back to Mystery of the Ages. What about those who say that, well, I don't need the, the body or the church. I can just kind of go it alone. This is in Mr. Armstrong's book. He says the loner, the individual Christian, who wants to climb up into the kingdom some other way than by Christ and his way through his church, is not being trained in Christ's manner of training, to rule and to reign with Christ in His kingdom. See, it's all about receiving the training that God wants for us to receive. That's why we go to services. That's why we, as the church, the members of the church, that's why we assemble together before God. Hebrews 10 says, don't forsake the opportunity to assemble together. We need that instruction. We need those services. We need the fellowship with God's family. And together with that, we need the prayer and the, and the fervent prayer and, the, and the, the Bible study, as well as the fasting and the, the meditation on God's ways. This is what it means to be a true Christian. You don't see that in the world today. It's a very shallow surface kind of religion carrying on in Mystery of the Ages, it says the kingdom of God will be the God family, a superbly and highly trained and organized family of God beings. The church is God's special school for training those he has selected and called to be trained in his church, to be kings and priests, to rule and to teach for their part in that kingdom. This is not strange. This is Revelation 5 and verse 10, or, or Revelation 1 verses 5 and 6. Called to teach called to be leaders, called to marry Jesus Christ. And then when that family is established, when that marriage happens, or when it's consummated, when the, the return of Christ happens, then it opens up to all of mankind, all of these potential children in the God family. What a beautiful plan and purpose. And yet for most in this world, it's just, when it comes to this subject, total ignorance. This is Mystery of the Ages, one last quote. It says here, Only those so trained in the church will be kings and priests in the kingdom of God. The person who says, I'll get my salvation alone outside of the church, is totally deceived. Now, Revelation 12, 9 says the whole world is deceived. It is possible that you can be totally deceived on this subject. That's why we need to open our eyes and humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God and receive His truth like a little child, a teachable little child. It says further, those in Satan's world cannot train themselves outside of the church for the special calling of being rulers and teachers in God's kingdom when Satan is removed and the world has become God's world. It says finally, the church is organized on God's pattern of mutual teamwork and cooperation to function perfectly together. We saw that in Ephesians 4. They shall become the God family as it shall exist at the time of Christ's second coming. Well, I don't have time to get into Acts chapter 3, where it talks about this beautiful and wonderful restitution of all things to this earth 
when God's government is finally reestablished on this earth and everyone living everywhere and on every corner of this earth receiving instruction and teaching from God, receiving the truth of God from God's family, well, for much more on the subject of God's true church, uh, request the true history of God's true church. You can call our operators today and we'll send that out to you right away, as well as this uh, little book here, the, the little book about uh, a book that surfaced at the end of this age called Malachi's Message. It tells you about how that, that publication, it's actually talked about in your Bible. We thank you for joining us on today's program, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.